ahead. Okay. Um, so, since we're here in, in Gibraltar, I thought I'd give you a, an overview of the history of bat conservation uh, and research that's been happening in Gibraltar over the years. And I'd like to start in, in the 1960s and 70s with a gentleman uh, by the name of George Balao. Now, he was a Gibraltarian speleologist, very interested in, in the caves of Gibraltar. He set up the um, Gibraltar Cave and Research Group, which he led for, uh, for a number of decades. Um, and he carried out extensive surveys of Gibraltar's caves from 1958 to 1983. Now, bear in mind about over 200 caves in, in Gibraltar. And uh, it's no surprise that it took him 25 years to complete all of these surveys. Um, like most people who work in caves, he eventually took an interest in, in bats in the late 1960s. And uh, anyone who, who studies the work of uh, Balao will realize um, pretty early on that he was a very gifted illustrator. Um, so we've got some really beautiful plans and maps of the different um, caves of Gibraltar. But he also gave us these illustrations of, of some of the bats that he found here. So it's the Schreiber's bats from Martin's cave in Gibraltar. He even did some skeletons of uh, Myotis Myotis. But even the detail of the dentition of Myotis Myotis as well, with the dental formula, and even some of the ectoparasites from the Schreiber's bats in Gibraltar. So he was a very talented artist. Um, he was very keen on learning more about uh, bats. He, he wasn't a, a bat expert by his own uh, admission. Um, but he had a lot of um, literature on caves, uh, some of which had some articles on, on bats. So he came across the studies in speleology which had an article in it by John Hooper. Now, John Hooper was actually a bit of a pioneer in, in bat bioacoustics. Um, he actually started to develop and, and um, um, sort of tweak some, of, some kits into becoming the first detector, so the predecessor of our bat detectors that we use nowadays in the field. And uh, Balao writes to Hooper in, in 1968, specifically asking him about this kit, because he wants to learn more about the bats that he's trying to, to uh, protect in Gibraltar. And specifically, he tries to, to make his own bat detector. Of course, Balao is in, in Gibraltar, um, and he doesn't have a lot of resources, so he doesn't have a lot of uh, contact with, um, with bat specialists, so he has to write to them to try and find out more about them. So we're very grateful to Balao because, in fact, he was the first person um, to actually carry out a census of the bat populations of Gibraltar. And he gave us these, these figures. So, he calculated that there were about 20,000 myotis myotis bats in, in Gibraltar. Uh, now, I think that's a staggering figure, um, considering we're just under 7 kilometers squared. Um, almost 12,000 Miniopsura shiberzae, um, almost 4,000 uh, Pipistula species. He doesn't give us exactly which species, um, but he groups them together. And 500 uh, Rhinolophus, we don't know exactly which. There's, there's conf um, conflicting evidence if it's Ariale or Hipposidurus. And he also counted 260 uh, bats of an unknown species. Uh, now, these were at different um, sites, and we don't know if maybe he just couldn't identify these, these bats at the time, possibly. Um, we also know at the time there were Tadurida and Nyctilus, but he wasn't because of the nature of these animals. He wasn't able to quantify these at the time. But that gave us an initial figure, at least for the 60s and 70s, of 36,500 bats in Gibraltar, a pretty healthy population. Um, and it's not, no surprise considering the number of caves that we have in Gibraltar. Now, jumping into the 1980s, um, an ecologist named Mike Wade from the, from the UK, he visits Gibraltar in, in 1986. He contacted the various authorities in Gibraltar, um, both civil and military, because some of these caves were very difficult to access, and he had to access through a, through a military zone. So he made sure that he, he contacted everyone and, and got this sorted before he arrived here. And he reports in 1986 major and wide-ranging declines in bat numbers over the last 20 to 30 years. Many well-known bat roosts formerly holding estimated numbers of between 1,000 and 6,000 bats uh, now no longer appear to be used, while others only contain a fraction of past numbers. Now, this is the first um, evidence of a decline of bats in Gibraltar. Now, bear in mind that this is only 10 to 15 years after Balao's census. Um, so that's a pretty short period of time to, to um, see this drastic change. Um, he prepared a very detailed report, which he um, uh, left with the authorities in, in Gibraltar, which included some recommendations as well. Um, and uh, this is a little summary that Andrea very kindly provided with me from Bat News in the UK. Uh, this is a photo taken from one of the Minneopterus uh, roosts in Gibraltar, which I'm pleased to say we still have um, Minneopterus in this particular tunnel. And uh, they still roost in that exact spot in, inside the tunnel as well. Um, and he um, tries to, to ascertain why 
um, this sharp decline in, in bats at the time. So um, he realizes there's a, there's a military weaponry range that's been set up outside one of the most important routes in Gibraltar, just outside some caves. Um, regularly visited uh, caves, a lot of disturbance of people coming into caves um, and disturbing the bats. Increased pressure from tourism. Um, the frontier with Spain had just reopened um, in, in the 1980s. Um, that's created a, a lot of uh, tourism and a lot of pressure on the, on the natural spaces of Gibraltar. And active persecution as well. Unfortunately, um, perceptions of bats, as we know, um, are, are not exactly positive, um, especially at the time. Um, and we see things like smokeouts, catching and, and shooting of bats as well. Um, rapid urban development as well. He calculated that 21% of the bat roosts um, that were actually recorded by, by Balao um, had, had disappeared. And um, he also um, thought that there could be a bit of a, a natural uh, reason as well, um, at least in the urbanized areas, uh, with some habitat competition with large numbers of migrant swifts, for example. Now, the Gibraltar Ornithological Society was founded in 1976. Um, it eventually expanded into what is now the Gibraltar Ornithological and Natural History Society. Um, and uh, it has various, various sections, like an um, invertebrate section, a botany section, and that also includes a, a mammal section. Um, at the time, in the, in the 90s, this was led by Tony Santana. And uh, we see a first attempt at uh, implementing bat conservation measures from, from GONS. Um, and this took the form of preventing access into important cave and tunnel roosts, um, creating awareness campaigns as well to, to tell the people of Gibraltar why, why the bats were important. And they also published um, uh, booklets on bats and swifts in, in building. Um, this was uh, Santana with, with John Cortez as well, um, primarily uh, aimed to target the construction industry in Gibraltar, um, talking about how we should convert uh, roofs and, and things like that. And uh, also in the early 1990s, just after the Bat Conservation Trust is founded in, in London, Tony Hudson of the Conservation Trust visits Gibraltar. He'd been in contact with Tony Hudson as well. And uh, he visited various sites with him in Gibraltar, but also in nearby Spain. And he reported much the same as, um, as Wade did. Um, he found few Minioptrus in, in a tunnel in, in Gibraltar, a few Pipistrels in flight, but little, little else. In Spain, he did find uh, a Mahaley horseshoe bat, um, now, the reason I mention this, even though I'm focusing my talk on, on Gibraltar, um, is because it's important to know what's immediately um, nearby as well. And we're talking about 300 meters from the frontier fence um, in, in Gibraltar. So um, it is important that when we take, um, uh, we think of conservation management plans for Gibraltar, we consider what's nearby and what could potentially be, be coming in as well. And uh, he actually pledges to provide assistance to, to the Ornithological and Natural History Society in developing a bat conservation program for Gibraltar and providing resources. Um, from, from the Bat Conservation Trust. So there's initial contacts there with, with BCT from the UK. And uh, in fact, he was very instrumental in, in arranging for the UK Department of the Environment at the time uh, to propose a, a project funded by the Foreign and Commonwealth Office um, in, in actual fact to, um, to work on the, on the work that had already been carried out and to build upon that, that work. Um, and uh, they eventually provided things like uh, bat boxes that were set up in various locations in, in Gibraltar. So there was, there was some positive aspect to it. They realized that there was a, a decline and they were trying to do something about it. So um, before this, um, the Gibraltar Ethological and Natural History Society as well were carrying out uh, bat talks. So at first it was known as the Eurobats um, um, bat nights that they were doing on a yearly basis to people in Gibraltar, telling people about the, the importance of bats and creating awareness. And um, they even um, did some monitoring of the Schreiber's colony, the Minioptus uh, colony in, in Gibraltar, um, and they were doing regular counts to see how the population was doing, and uh, it seemed fairly stable at the time. Now, in, in October 2013, we established the Jib Bats project. Uh, it wasn't Halloween, just by chance, um, and uh, that was set up by my now good friend James Shipman, who came over from the UK to, to carry out this, um, this project with us. And, um, it was evident from the start that, that James didn't just want to come here and do a survey for himself, and, and off he went. Um, from the start, he was very keen on training uh, local people in, in bat conservation, and he, he had the idea of, of having a project that had some continuity, and uh, that would be carrying on for some years. Um, so the project was licensed by the government of Gibraltar, and um, we started with very, very basic questions. So we almost assumed no prior knowledge of the bats of Gibraltar. We wanted to see what was there now. Um, there had been a few uh, reports that um, um, some bats that we knew hadn't been seen for a long time. They were still, still on official lists. 
Um, so we wanted to see, look, are they really there, are they not? Um, so we started from scratch. And we wanted to know where the bats were. Now, this is where maybe we, we didn't uh, totally assume no prior knowledge because we had this data from, from Palau. We knew where the bat roosts were in the 60s and 70s. So we started from there. And uh, how many bats are there? So we needed to carry out population censuses and what species were found in, in Gibraltar. So we carried out our census in the first two years of the project. And we found straight away that there were no Myotis Myotis in Gibraltar, zero. We didn't even find any Myotis, uh, any uh, bats of the genus Myotis in Gibraltar, no echolocation calls, nothing at all. Um, but we did find the um, population of Miniopteris Schreiberzai. Now, uh, that's over 700, but that's only at the peak time, which is in November. Um, they seem to be transiting through, through Gibraltar before they go into their wintering sites elsewhere. And uh, the Pipistrella species, we were able to confirm that they were two species. Um, the Pipistrellus pygmaeus and the Pipistrellus cooley, and we find those in one uh, roost where they actually um, breed there together. And we found no Rhinolophus um, species. You'll see later on that we find one Rhinolophus in, in Gibraltar later on, but just the one individual um, by chance. We do find Deptesicus isabellinus for the first time in Gibraltar. It hadn't been recorded previously. Um, however, I think that's maybe that's one of the unknown species that Palau wasn't able to identify because even though they're not common, I wouldn't say they're common. Um, but they are around, and every time that we, we do some trapping, perhaps in the botanic gardens, if we stay there long enough, we will catch one or two of, uh, of the species. Um, but we haven't found any roosts, not, not yet. Um, Tadarida teniotis and Nicola species, again, um, we, we find them here in Gibraltar, but it's very difficult to quantify. So that gives us a total of just under 1,000 bats. That's a far cry from what we saw in, in the 60s and, and 70s. So if we compare the data um, from Palau censuses to ours, we realize that we've lost 35,500 bats in just a few decades. Um, that's a 97% decline of these animals. Um, so what was the cause for this, for this decline? Now, we don't think there's a single cause. Um, there's, there's many uh, contributing factors. Um, but on a, on a local scale, um, we see that there's a lot of uh, landscape uh, change and loss of habitat in, in those early years. Um, rapid urban development as well. Um, light pollution is a, is a big concern. Um, increase in tourism, as we, as we said. You can see that some of these are the same that, as what Mike White was reporting in, in 1986. Not much change there. Unregulated caving as well, people going into, into caves um, for sport and disturbing these, these roosting bats. And again, persecution. We have reports of people smoking these bats out for fun, um, unfortunately. Um, to talk a bit about uh, landscape change, um, the, the landscape on the, on the Rock of Gibraltar has been constantly altered over the last three centuries, even, even prior to that. Um, that's an early photo of Gibraltar where you can see on the top left a, a large denuded area that was used as a water catchment area. And also just above the town area, um, that was, um, the trees were all felled and they were kept low by constantly grazing goats uh, for military and defense purposes. Now, inadvertently, what that created was open habitats. Um, which were very good for, for wildflowers, for invertebrates, uh, and became good feeding grounds for these bats. So eventually, when those were no longer need to be kept, um, we didn't need to have a, a water source there, or we didn't need to keep the, um, the site clear for military purposes. Eventually, that's, that grew into a, a thick maquis, um, with the exception of some um, uh, fire breaks, sorry, um, which also at least had some open area on, on the rock. But eventually these, these became overgrown as well. And there's, been, there's been some recent efforts to, to bring those back to, a, to a open uh, habitats. And also in the isthmus, the sandy isthmus that connects um, the north area of the Rock of Gibraltar to the rest of the Iberian Peninsula, that had uh, seasonally wet habitats. Um, and we found uh, that it had sort of a wet marshy area on the Spanish side. And also on the Gibraltar side, there was um, an artificial, or, or rather it was an, an initial sort of marsh area that was expanded for military purposes and created a lagoon. Um, those became important um, feeding areas for these bats, we think. And eventually, urban development um, reduced those to, to very, very small pockets. Um, you can see there the extent of the, the urban development. Light pollution, um, again, as I said, a big concern. This is a, a radiance map of the area around Gibraltar. Um, from 2013, so when we started the project. Um, but already, just a few years later, you can already see increased uh, lighting. And this isn't something um, that's only happening in Gibraltar. It's, it's happening everywhere. It comes with, with the, the way that we live, with our societies. Um, but you see as well 
that's in 2013, there were still some dark areas in the countryside in Spain. By 2017 already, there's been some spillage of that radiance into those areas as well. So what species did we find in, in Gibraltar? I'll whiz through these just so I don't run out of time. Um, Pipistellus pygmaeus, Pipistellus cooli, Minuopsis schreiberzi, Epteticus isabellinus, as I said, uh, Vinolophus firmiquinum, one. We found one bat, uh, <laughs> just the one time. Uh, we haven't found it at any echolocation or cause or anything since. Um, Tadavida tenuitis and Nyctilus lasiopterus. Sadly, we can report now that Myotis myotis is locally extinct in Gibraltar. Um, we also carried out uh, monitoring of the, the known colony of Schreiber's bats in Gibraltar, and we realized that um, we found uh, a peak of up to 700 bats in, in Gibraltar, um, but they're only here for a few days, no more than a week, um, and then they're off again. Um, we see another little peak of about uh, 200 bats in March, and uh, then they disappear again to their maternity colonies until they return in, in November, um, presumably for breeding. Now, what conservation measures have we been, been taking since the start of the project? Um, we're very grateful to the Department of the Environment, uh, who have been purchasing uh, bat boxes and installing them uh, around Gibraltar following our advice. We've been installing bat-friendly gates on a few of our cave and tunnel roosts as well. Um, now, these follow the recommendations by Eurobats. Um, we, were, we were concerned as well that um, we're talking about Schreiber's bats, and they don't tend to like these too much. So what we did was we increased the spaces between the bars a little bit. Um, and we've seen with our thermal imaging cameras that they use the bars quite, quite easily. They fly in and out with no problem. In any case, we left the top open as well, just to uh, allow an easier um, ingress of bats. Um, we prepared a very comprehensive report um, for the government with our findings and recommendations as well. So whenever um, government issues any, any sort of management plan to do with bats, they've got all the information um, that they need. And we've been carrying out international uh, bat nights in Gibraltar, supporting the work that GONS has been doing for over 10 years already in Gibraltar. Um, and uh, we've had about, the, the maximum that we've had is 300 people in one single event. So these, these are well-attended events and, and people learn about the work that we do. Uh, this was only yesterday. Um, I gave a talk to, to some kids in a, in a school in Gibraltar, seven to eight-year-olds, about a month and a half ago. And since then, they've been carrying out a, a project on, on bats. Um, and they've been guiding it themselves, which I think was fantastic. They chose that they wanted to talk about um, the, how they can help bats in Gibraltar. And they carried out the own, their own project. And yesterday, they presented it to, to us. Um, and I thought that was absolutely fantastic. Um, the parents learned a lot as well. <laughs> And we've even made it to the cover of the national press as well, which is good. Uh, we've carried out some bat care as well. Whenever there's a, an injured bat in Gibraltar, or some pups that fall out of the, the roosts um, during the maternity time as well. They're brought to us, so we nurse them as best we can to then release them again. But wait a minute. Was it really Myotis Myotis that was rooting in Gibraltar all those years ago after all? <laughs> Um, the first ID records that we have of this species are from Balao, as I said. And the numbers suggest that Gibraltar had a source population of this species. Very important breeding colonies as well, we know. Um, maternity colonies. The last two preserved specimens of the species we have in the Gibraltar National Museum. That's one of the two females that we have. Um, they both appear to be pregnant, actually. Um, unfortunately, we don't have much detail on, on um, their provenance. But uh, we've got those, those down. And... Um, we wanted to know whether they were identified properly. Now, no disrespect to, to Balao, he wasn't a bat specialist by his own admission, um, but we thought we'd, we'd check. So we carried out some, some biometrics, um, and the results were not particularly helpful. Um, the, the data sits right between um, the, uh, the ranges of Myotis Myotis and Myotis Blythe, which is the other contender that it could be. Um, so we thought, okay, we'll carry out some, some DNA work, we'll do, take a biopsy of it, send it to our colleagues in, in the Nyana um, Biological Station, and unfortunately, they were not able to extract anything from it. Now, that's preserved in ethanol uh, at the moment, but we don't know about the time it was preserved in, in formaldehyde, which would have been common practice back in the day. Um, so we're going to try and, and resample again from tissue that hasn't been in direct contact with the, with the preservative to see whether there's something there. And why am I saying this? Why is it important to, um, to find out what species we had in Gibraltar? Well, it would talk of a possible reintroduction of the species at some point. Um, we know it's difficult. Only a few examples of reintroductions with bats um, have existed. But it's, it's important to know what bats we're dealing with before we try and reintroduce something that perhaps had never been here in the first place. Um, 
And we need to know whether the remaining local habitats are suitable for, for this bat. Uh, do they contain enough food? Is, is it going to sustain this population? And of course, where would we source these bats from? Um, there's already been some efforts, as, uh, as John Cortez told us, about uh, rewilding of habitats and restoration of habitats in Gibraltar. Now, the great Gibraltar sand dune on the eastern side of Gibraltar, if you've had a chance to see it, um, is a massive sand dune. Um, and it was covered in the early 20th century with uh, corrugated iron sheets to create a big water catchment for, for water for the population of Gibraltar. Um, eventually, when it stopped being used in 1993, um, slowly but surely, uh, they started removing the, the corrugated iron sheets to restore this, this habitat um, until it was completely uh, restored, at least to as best as we, we could get it. Um, and what this does is it creates a, a large percentage of open habitat again in Gibraltar. Um, so potentially this is one of the areas that can help to sustain um, those, uh, those future populations of bats in Gibraltar. The eastern side is riddled with, with caves as well, which they once lived in. So what does the future hold for, for bats in Gibraltar? Well, we'll continue doing what we're doing in Gibraltar with the Gibbats project on a local scale. Um, but now we're moving towards um, finding out what the tribal bats in particular are doing elsewhere when they're not in Gibraltar. So we're tracking them and uh, following them in the provinces of, of um, um, Malaga and Gadis as well and seeing what's what their extended network of caves uh, are, where they're moving to, at what times of year. And finally, a thanks to everyone who's contributed towards the, the project, the institutions as well, of course, to Sasemu for allowing me to present here. And thank you for listening. <laughs>